I'll be right in the middle of doing that when Michael types live. Like now. Hey, good morning, everybody. Or afternoon or evening, wherever you are. Or afternoon or evening, wherever you are. Oh, God, I hate that this thing does this. Every year's not mine. There. <laughs> I was doing uh, indexing last night, among other things, and you got to have YouTube volume on. And it remembers of all the programs that should remember things and should remember things. That's the one that just totally bites. <laughs> and by going to make one other setting change here. So there we go. Well, good Friday, everybody. It's Friday, which is the best news of the week. And the second best news is we're here for another Dramas Friday Pie Day. Hi, I'm Dave Rush. I'll be one of your hosts. Really I'm right here. So, you know, but I'll I'll suffer. And my friend. I'm Scott Jernigan, Editor-in-Chief for Total Seminars and uh, Dave's sidekick for the drama show. So there we go. We have been having a great time doing this together. Hope you guys are enjoying it as well. Uh, Scott is... He is secretly so much more knowledgeable about, about this stuff and, and so many other things in the world. He's, he's understated about what he knows and what he does, but when it comes time, man, you should see him answer questions and ask really insightful questions about things we're talking about and researching. So real pleasure to have you here, Scott. Good to be here, Dave. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me. And good to be anywhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm virtually in your living room, so it's great. <laughs> and I got to tell you, the family appreciates it. <laughs> Hello, everybody. We need to uh, build up a little bit more of a crowd, but we'll do our uh, our usual openings. It says uh, we come together every Friday or so to have a, an electronic place where we can get together. We can facilitate some learning. We can have a little bit of fun. We can learn a little bit about pies and go above and beyond raspberry pies. And that's what we're doing today. Got some really cool stuff going on. We're going to add on to last week's material. But this is just an opportunity for us to come together. And remember, this isn't just a pie show. It's an ask me anything. So Scott and I are ready to take your questions on any CompTIA topic, any techno topic, anything pretty much about religion and politics. Somebody asked, and, and we'll tell you now. Yeah, OK, so Scott says, fine, we'll do politics. I can see it in his face. <laughs> Uh, many thanks for everybody's well wishes regarding the weather that was due to pass here. There's folks who had some real unfortunate experience with it, and there's a lot of recovery to do, but I'm happy to say that uh, most of the folks at Total Seminars were barely impacted. We have at least one of our folks who got some serious impact, and he's not uh, able to contact the company very well. We do have word that he's doing okay, but uh, infrastructure up in his neck of the woods where he went the hole up did take a, a beating. And uh, he's got no internet and very little phone service. But for the most part, we're all functioning and ready to keep moving almost as if nothing happened. So we hope those of you who might have been in the path are doing well as well. And look forward, if you're not, to your rapid recovery and you're joining us again. Absolutely. You want to tell everybody how to talk to us and save some money? Sure. Sounds good. Me too. Good. I'm going to put a contact sheet up and fire away. Can you see that? Are we on? I, I see it. <laughs> okay, you're on. So if you if you have questions about today's show or want to contact Dave uh, about any of the topics he covers, uh, feel free to email him at davr at totalsim.com or even put his personal email up drushtx at yahoo.com. You can check him out on Steam. We're all gamers here uh, at bloodrushtx. If you want to contact us by phone, uh, the number for the office is 281-922-4166. Uh, it'll get forwarded to our answering people and, and eventually get to us. So it won't be necessarily a live person immediately, uh, but it, it can work to get a hold of us. Also, I totally do that too. Work. Sorry about that. I'm fixing this now. There's oh. You. oh, and if you want to contact me, that's my email, scottj at totalsim.com. Uh, my Steam account is scarhart, no E, and it's still the same phone number. How about that? <laughs> G 
just for being here this week. Uh, our salespeople have put together an amazing deal just for you. 50% off all of our A plus and network plus super bundles. A super bundle is the uh, videos, practice test software and simulations for A plus and net plus, and also the security plus video and total tester practice test bundle. So just use the code MMLive824 at checkout at totalsim.com and save a tremendous amount of money on what we consider to be the best CompTIA training products on the market. <laughs> That's good only through the 30th, which is Sunday. So yeah. things will change. There'll be, code, yeah. There'll be something different next week. And of course, don't forget, if you're a teacher, you're doing remote classes, contact Kathy Y at totalsim.com. She's got stuff for you. Uh, to help make remote instruction much more fun, much more easier, and much more cost-effective. She's got some swag and some just insane deals from what I heard recently. <clears throat> cool. Yeah. Insane deals. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do the car deal. That's right. It's <laughs> <laughs> hey, Andre's here. Nice to see you, Andre. I was thinking about you as we did this, because I know you're wondering when we're going to get... Uh, Total Sims in the Sec Plus Super Bundle soon, very soon. Stop pointing at me, Dave. <laughs> so yeah, for those who have, aren't in on the, on the joke, uh, the Security Plus Total Sims are in production. Uh, things got a little crazy when we all got locked down and uh, priority shifted. Uh, I had anticipated getting it done over the over the spring, but now I'm rapidly approaching the fall and it's still not done. So. I'm working on it. Well, greetings to everybody. All of our, uh, many of our usual faces are here. So I see Greg Davis punched in first. Hello, Brendan S. So you're my Plex guy, man. So I have had a heck of a learning experience with Plex this week. And because of the hurricane, much of my research time uh, was taken up. And got to say that last night was my first really successful soup to nuts installation because I've had to do a lot of experimenting and not a lot of time to do it. Uh, and I'll share that all with you as we go along. But uh, Brendan, if I, it's Brendan or Brandon, one of our two guys uh, who's got some Plex experience. So we're looking forward to your input. But uh, I do have, have the thing pared down from what initially took me about 20 hours for the work to about 20 minutes now. Oh, man, you can't imagine what exploded wow. last night. They threw me for a loop and suddenly I thought, you know, I'm all ready to go. I'm just going to flip the switch and we're going to do this. And then, wait, that doesn't work. And <laughs> oh, always good to have that happen. Oh, yeah, I mean, the night before instead of this morning. <laughs> Never put off. True. Uh, Brendan says it's Brandon, not him. Yes. So, okay. Well, Tolowitz here and Andre de Goyert. Our favorite non-Belgian, non-Peruvian, non-Paraguayan. Uh, Ajake is here. Uh, he's been in AMAs. It's the first time I've ever seen him in uh, our Pi Day Friday drama. Drama for new people. Uh, we call it the, uh, used to call it Dave Rush, Ask Me Anything. Now it's dramas because it's Dave Rush, Ask Me Anything and Scott. So, <laughs> but whatever. Call it anything that makes you happy. Ellen Duggan is here. I, I, that's, that came out Ellen. It was Alan. Greetings, nice try. Marvin's here. Good to see you. Oh, yeah, you said you were going to pop in. Uh, somebody wrote me, one of the, the AMA regulars. No, no, he wasn't. He's a new guy uh, that we've seen in the last two AMA. Oh, John Doraval. John Doraval wrote me this week and said, uh, what's the deal with this pie stuff? So <laughs> I got to send a nice long response and expecting to see him here today. I'm Keith. Welcome. I have seen you. I think I've seen you here before. You're going to buy it all, huh? <laughs> Way to go. We get to keep our jobs for another week. <laughs> <laughs> That's always good. <laughs> oh, nice, Tullowit. I, I would have just stopped with the every penny, but good follow up. Yes, I think a lot about you, Andre. I get up in the morning and think about Andre de Goyert and my last thought before I go to bed. How can I tune the show to best appeal to Andre? <laughs> Mr. Dave, 
how do you how do I find your YouTube so I can sub? Uh, so almost everybody's YouTube uses the same format. Uh, it's youtube.com slash user. And of course, like if you come to Total Seminars, it's slash user slash Total Seminars. My personal YouTube, there's nothing much uh, particularly interesting there. I, there's one AMA episode that we had to do in a crisis when we first started experimenting and uh, Mike had a, a, a sudden disconnect. And there's a couple interesting things there, but uh, it's uh, youtube.com slash user slash drushtx, D-R-U-S-H-T-X. There's some wacky stuff there. But yeah, please subscribe and, and certainly subscribe to uh, the Total Seminars if you haven't. Okay, Brendan. So it was Brendan, not Brandon. You're new to Plex. Cool. Me too. But he said he would be here. But he's got 20 hours in, so, you know. There you go. <laughs> Tell what's talking to you. What do you got? Uh, since you just dodged a storm, this is probably a good time to tell us about the measures Total Sim uses for securing data and redundancies in case of disaster. One, we keep a lot of our stuff up in the cloud these days. Uh, cloud storage uh, long term is not that expensive anymore. Uh, so that's a, an easy way. I mean, I have, I have no idea where <laughs> our data is stored. It's somewhere probably in Idaho or South Dakota. I don't know. We're still using <laughs> it's up there in the cloud. We also have our local servers with lots of uh, on-site backups. And then in times of crisis, uh, hurricanes don't come suddenly. They come, you know, they give us at least a week or two warning. And so we, as we spread to the four winds, we'll each take a component and just take it with us. So, you know, as long as we survive, the gear will survive too. So it's kind of unorthodox, but we're a relatively small company. Uh, Talent wise, we're big, but uh, personnel wise, we're small. So it's easy enough to do. If I don't get assigned to take something, I select something that's interesting and useful for me. So if the company doesn't survive, eh, there's nobody to return it to. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I had to take the entire VR system. Exactly. <laughs> the first thing that came to my mind, if I were going to snag something out of Total Sim, I know there's great editing gear and, and, and cameras and all that stuff. Let the production people have that. Give me that VR system. <laughs> that sounds great. Now. Good to see you again from DC. I'm going to assume that that's District of Columbia, but I'll bet there are eight other interpretations that could be just as valid. Hello, Andrew Hutz. Nice to see you again. Total Seminars channel. Is anybody here Total Seminars channel since Mike's not logged in? I don't think anybody's going to see that. So you're stuck with Scott and I. Uh, but that, that's the, uh, the moniker that Mike uses when he uh, logs in and runs the show. So, oh, that's true. Yeah. Go ahead. I'll read it. Uh, can you combine Pi with Lego Mindstorms Robotics? OK, so I understand two of those words. When you string those three together, I, I, let's just go back. I don't know what Mindstorms is. It's their, well, it's their, line, of, their line of robotics, basically. Okay. Um, look, I know that Pies are integrated into zillions of robotics projects. Everything from the Pi Zero all the way up to the full-scale monsters, uh, the big Pi 4B with eight gigs. Um, and, and they're nice for that. I'm not sure that they're the best thing because they're kind of an overkill computer. Uh, Arduinos and things like that are probably in many instances a better solution but i don't know the mindstorm products and while i'm capable of doing robotics of all the zillions of projects that i've gotten my hands onto i have not done much with robotics yeah tell it i want to build a walking pie say again tell it, i want to build a walking pie yeah you wouldn't be the first right alice welcome back glad to see you this week so we got Cody done, but we're going to do Plex today. And Dr. Quinn, I was just talking about you with the family. We have, because we surf past a Dr. Quinn commercial, the old medicine woman show. And uh, mine is in the cloud with grandma. That sounds like a great old folk tune. Mine is in the cloud with grandma. <laughs> I've amused myself there. <laughs> Who knew this was also not just a tech show, but a, a musical variety show? 
you don't play banjo, but you could do that on the mando pretty well. There you go. I could do chords on the electric. <laughs> <laughs> a little rhythm. Jow is here. Very good. Yeah, go ahead and say hi to Andrew and Steve. Don't worry about Scott and I. We're just watching the conversation roll by. <laughs> oh, he did say hi. I know. <laughs> there we go. Hi, Dave. <laughs> right next line. Right. Andre's talking. Didn't know Lego Mindstorm existed. See, I'm not the only one. My son was a Lego, Lego Mindstorms is a Lego thing that you can use to make robot shapes and I see you looking it up. I'll let it go while you do that. Uh, Ajake, I heard that Linux and Raspberry Pi were used on space shuttles. <laughs> okay, well, they're not running the space shuttle. How's that? Uh, Raspberry Pi Foundation, based over in England, uh, worked a deal with the ISS folks and NASA and uh, I can't think of the name of the Russian space agency. So it's the Russian space agency. Uh, to allow students to create programs and processes that could run on RASPIs. And they sent up a couple of RASPIs. And then the winning submissions, they almost do this every year now of, I don't know how many submissions that they, they finalize, but five, 10, 15, whatever it is, uh, they upload the code for that stuff over the uh, internet link that's available with ISS. And they schedule time for the astronauts to run experiments on the pies that were sent up. Uh, it's really, really interesting. And I think to me, one of the most interesting things was what they had to go through to get the Raspberry Pis blessed to exist on the station and to use station power and all that. It was a, a, a multi-year process that had to get all kinds of testings and approvals and you know RF emission testing and current draw and what happens in failure modes. That's, it's a fascinating thing. Go do a little poking around at raspberrypi.org uh, for some information. There's a name for the project. It's not Space Pi, Orbit Pi, something along those lines. You, it, I'm sure it's easy to find. So yes, they do use Raspberry Pis on there. Again, not to run the stuff, but to do experiments for students on behalf of the students. That's very cool. Burr. Andre, you bagged your message. I'll, I'll tell you what he said. Don't quit your day job. Are you sure? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I think he was afraid he was going to insult you as opposed to make us You know laugh. what? You guys can say anything to, at, or about me. I will not be insulted. I don't take almost anything very seriously. Uh, tell it with Scott. I should have known. There is nothing a pie can't do. Magazine already has a project combining. There we go. Yeah, you're right. You know, that's a the 99th inviolable truth of life. There is nothing new. I mean, obviously, there are the super geniuses who are coming up with super things. But every time I think I come up with the world's most brilliant invention, idea, or whatever, step number one is to look it up online. And sure enough, somebody's already done that. Peanut butter and pickle juice. It's done. <laughs> now you're making me hungry. Yeah. <laughs> Right, Magpie Magazine's got it and uh, a million other third-party sources. Magpie is a, a publication, a, a weekly publication by Raspberry Pi Foundation. They've got projects in there and ways to implement education, things like that. There we go, Ross Cosmos. Thank you, Tolowit. Amazing things you can do with Lego and Arduino and or Pi, sure. Cool, well, we're through caught up with questions. So let me uh, refer to my little handy dandy layout, talk a little bit about what's going up. We'll come back and pick up some more questions in a few minutes. Sounds good. Thanks. Sorry, I gotta go reading my notes. All right, so I kind of like this uh, as a semi-formal thing. Uh, I, I sort of treat this as an instructor, so bear with me for just a minute. Uh, while I cover all the, the bases that a good instructor could, should, would do. So first and foremost, a discussion that Scott and I had about this stuff. I want to remind you that many of the things that we do on RASPI doesn't have to be done on a RASPI. So if you want to try these things just because they're fun or interesting or something like that, 
you can probably do it in Windows. You can probably do it on an Ubuntu VM or a dedicated machine that's got some other Linux box on it. Many of the things we can do can be done on a Mac or on Android. So great if you can do this on a Pi, especially if we're talking about things like learning Linux commands or uh, structures like that. It's, you can probably do that on any old Ubuntu. We just kind of add Pi into the mix here because I think they're cool uh, and I love doing experimental things with them. Uh, and they're not the only single board computers out there. There's orange pies and banana pies and beagle bones. And the list is, I don't know, 70 or 80 kind of common single board computers last time I looked. And that's been about a year and a half, maybe longer. But the pie's the best. So. Right. So where have we been? I only go back as far as a week on these reviews. Last Friday, we did a, a kind of a an AirSats walkthrough on how to install. Oh, wait a minute. We did this one for real. Uh, we did a real installation of Wireshark on a Raspi. It's a very simple thing to do. And again, you can install this on Windows. You can install it on a Mac, whatever makes you happy. But it's just awesome to be able to do Wireshark on a Pi, I think. I was really stunned when I discovered that that was even possible. And it was one of those things that once you installed it, uh, there was no loss. It's a, it runs just as well on a Pi as it does on any high-powered desktop computer. So super cool. Why don't you tell them what Wireshark is? No way. That's a <laughs> secret, man. <laughs> right. So if you're playing in the Net Plus Arena or Sec Plus Arena, you have some basic familiarity with it. If you haven't gotten there yet, uh, Wireshark is a program that listens to the cable that's attached to your computer for any traffic that can make it to your computer, stuff that's sent directly to or from that computer, broadcast messages, multicast messages, and with some heavy magic, we can even get stuff that's not intended to go to your computer, go to it. It will capture those packets and disassemble them and analyze them and show you very human and very programmatic methods of seeing that. We're gonna do a Wireshark today if you haven't seen it, uh, because one of the things I try to do every week when possible is to do some kind of protocol capture that we need to know for one or more of the classes and look at the critical components of it. Today, I'm gonna to do a DHCP capture, which is really cool. Everybody uh, who studies DHCP, that's that protocol that when you turn your computer on, it says, I don't have an IP address. Somebody out there, give me one. That's DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. <clears throat> See, I'm not Mike, I know what it all stands for most of the time. <laughs> and built into the DHCP process is four steps that everybody abbreviates as DORA, discover, offer, request, and acknowledge. So we're going to see that in real Wireshark today. Cool. And yeah. So we did a Wireshark install last week. We also used Wireshark last week to capture two kinds of connections, one from a browser to an unsecure web server, and then one from a browser to a secure web server. And so we were able to dig into the TCP IP processes, the three-way handshake, SYN, SYNAC, ACK. If you don't, if you're not familiar with this, yes, don't panic. Uh, it's stuff that we cover many times and we will again today. And you can see it in the archive versions of this. So go back and dig that out. We checked out port 80 for unsecure web servers and 443 for secure web servers, followed the streams and looked at the unsecure content that's going on and why it's, a potentially dangerous thing to do. And cool. So that kind of caught us up actually on some stuff that I'd been a little behind on. And then we started the big feature of the week. And that was installing a Kodi media server on a Raz Pi. And we kind of semi-faked it because of the technology necessary for us to see and, and capture what's going on with Zoom and Raz Pis and uh, VNC and things like that. That made it sort of impossible to do completely, but we walked through all the steps. I showed them, I published them, and then when we were all done, I showed you what the end result looks like and, and how to work it and how to configure it by having installed one on a Windows machine. What's really cool about Kodi, the Kodi media server, is it doesn't matter what platform you install it on, Pi, Windows, Mac, Android, and there's a, oh, uh, other versions of Linux, Ubuntu they look and work and act exactly the same once they're installed. So I didn't even have to say that. I could have lied and said, hey, now we're looking at this thing on the Pi, but I try to be a little bit honest with you when possible. 
So that's part one of what we've uh, started as a process. What we're going to do today is we're going to do another Wireshark thing. It's really quick. It's really interesting. It's the DHCP thing. And then we're going to do part two of the media server process. And that is installing a Plex server. And we're able to do that completely live and real on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, it's kind of a competitive product to Cody and not as good in some areas and better in some other areas. And I'll cover that as we dive into it. It was a complicated learning curve. Shouldn't be, it should be really simple, but it, again, because of time constraints and some other things, uh, it was a complicated curve. For you, it's gonna be much simpler. I'm gonna boil it down into a couple of very short steps that all happen quickly and easily once you know what's going on. Uh, but that's as far as I'm going to take it today. We're going to have a Cody server installed over here. We're going to have a Plex server installed over here. They can be installed on the same box. And there's good reasons to do that. And there's good reasons to do them on separate boxes, whatever works for you. The one thing I'm not going to do today, I'm going to reserve that for next Friday, is integrate the two together. We'll look at why we want to do that and how to do it. It's actually very, very simple. But uh, some of the stuff I got to get into today is a little bit time consuming and it, it's all going to mash together if I try and do that all together. Gotcha. So let me show you one thing here ever so quick. Yeah. Ever so quick, but. Yeah. So while you look at a question or two, I will <laughs> find what I did with it. The questions are all straight up pie questions. So okay. I'll leave them to you. All right. Well, as soon as I get this thing posted, I see what's going on. Oh, I see. Okay. Although there is a lot of, um, you look like Kenny Rogers. <laughs> Me and my roaster. And then, of course, Telewit is throwing out pun after pun. After yeah, pun. I, did, I didn't even have to look to know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't actually laughing at you. You were all serious talking about Wireshark, and I started laughing and it, because I'm reading the live stream right above our heads. So, okay. yeah. <laughs> all right, I got something to share now. Okay. Do this, click this, touch that, smack this, beat that, and bammo. So this is a screenshot of one of the pages of a Plex server. What we usually have over here is a, a home screen. And you can see this is somebody who named their Plex server Edril Pi. So that was run on a Pi server. And You've got some choices of music or movie or photos or TV shows. And it's like almost every other media server in very raw respect. Just wanted you to have a quick idea. If you got a lot of movies or things that you want that you've saved, you want to sort through. We've got an alphabetic pull down and pull up, sort through. And just want you to have a, a quick glance at it for now. We'll have a full run view of it as we go on. So I think that catches me up to where I want to be on my outline. Let me check and see if I'm missing anything here. Yeah, for anybody else who's, who's ever interested in going above and beyond the, the follow along steps that I'm going to do today, Plex.tv and Cody.tv from last week. Uh, and I want to answer one question that uh, we got on the Wednesday AMA. <clears throat> Man, it's a terrible answer. I'm not going to love it, but. It is what it is, and, and you'll recognize this answer from 100,000 other questions. So Andy STL on Wednesday, Wednesday, I don't know if he's here, but I'm going to answer this for everybody else. He, uh, he said, on the Wednesday AMA, a couple of posts, Dave, enjoyed your Raspberry Pi on building a media server on Plex. Is there a way to move saved video from a commercial DVR to a Pi? And we asked a couple of questions after that, and he filled in uh, that he was talking about either a TiVo or a Genie. DVR and I didn't get, uh, I didn't research those DVRs in specific. I did some generic research and the answer to the question in general is, this won't surprise anybody, maybe. There's basically three kinds of DVRs out there. One of them is computer-based, PC-based. You can install DVR software on your computer and save movies and download videos and whatever. And in that instance, it's really, really easy to transfer the, the movies over to a Plex server because basically it's a file copy. There is a folder on your Plex server machine 
to store, or there are folders, plural, to store whatever kind of media you've got, and all we got to do is copy it over there. There's another kind of system that's an appliance-based that's really just a PC or it's a, a box that will save content in standard formats, MP3s, MP4s, and so forth. And again, those things, same deal. I can just pull those files off of there and copy them over to our Plex server. And then there are ones that save or encrypt in their own proprietary formats. And that stuff, of course, not easy, if even possible, to transfer over to your uh, Plex server. So not one of those nice, straightforward, OK, yeah, here's what you got to do. It's real simple. All right, going over to take a quick peek at questions and see what you guys are all laughing about. You left off at 2.19. Yeah, I, I, I was smart and logged it. Oh, Andy was here. He's here. Oh, great. So I hope you got that, Andy. And are now stabbing your screen. Dave didn't help me at all. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, hey, you have a, in, struck me here with a technology with which I am not familiar. Does Raspberry Pi support logical volume management, LVM V2? I don't know, but I will by Monday and... If we're not doing the show Monday, if Mike is back in town. Hey, do we know where Mike is? Uh, he is in somewhere in Wyoming. He's still Wyoming. Okay, because I knew we were talking about yeah. him going to Denver here in short order. Actually, he's in he's in the mountains in Colorado. Okay. He, so he knew he would not be able to log in today. Okay. Well, another time. Hope he's back by Monday. And if not, hope we can do it. All right. Let me go save. Andre K's note to a folder or to my my question file, and I will have an answer for that uh, the next time I'm on. Certainly by next Friday, if not sooner. And you can send me an email uh, with that question, and as soon as I get the answer, I will email you right back with everything that I learn about it. Jiminy Christmas. <laughs> Thank you for the Kenny Rogers reference. Actually, I know. You know what? When my beard was brown, my wife said, I look forward to you having uh, the salt and pepper beard that Kenny Rogers did back in the brown days. Uh, and it went by so fast. It was kind of salt and pepper for about 20 minutes and then just went mostly white. <laughs> she likes you for those 20 minutes, though. Exactly. <laughs> You're so handsome. <laughs> <sighs> They're amazing. Okay, I'm gonna title that. Finish. Okay, so Zhao is finishing up A plus studies, gonna schedule exam soon, and frankly, thinking about Linux essentials. I think that's a brilliant call. Scott and I and Michael and Mike uh, all believe and understand that uh, a good tech and, and a good IT professional, to whatever degree you you go to, has got to be functional, conversational, literate in Linux, right, Scott? Absolutely, Good. absolutely. Not just for the CompTIA exams, but just as a tech. When so many of our server machines uh, run on Linux these days that you simply can't and shouldn't avoid it, so. All right, lots of people doing research on LVM2, V2? Yep. Tell me what your gambler reference. Yeah. <laughs> I tell you, that was a oh, reason. Oh man, the whole that whole response at two twenty two. Goodness, as long as you don't do a coward of the county reference, I'm going to let it slide. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh... oh. thank you, Jockey. I appreciate that. It's a compliment. My wife, Lucille. I love that song. You picked a fine time to leave me loose wheel with 400 children lost in the fields. I think that's the lyric of that. <laughs> Greg Davis. That's tell what talking to Greg. Very welcome, Andy. Happy to do that. Let's see. Joe, I forgot to, uh, forgot to share 
I bought a compressed air USB gadget called Opolar Air Duster. They say no more air compressor can need it. That's impressive because there is so relatively little power coming out of a USB port for it to generate enough blow and you know unless it's you know kind of charging up a system uh, that's very impressive so i'm going to i'm going to save that and look that up when we get done that looks interesting um, as for no more air can needed uh, i don't blow my computers out inside my house cuz that's a dust storm that will seriously get me in trouble with the misses. The jockey, when using the DVR software, do you have to connect to a TV PCI expansion card? I the research I did was generic, so I uh, I have used USB external TV tuners. Um, I don't know the specific technology necessary to create a computer-based DVR software. Again, something fun for me to look up. Probably a pretty easy research project for everyone. I love all this research though. Thanks guys. White pepper. <laughs> uh, we do these shows just because just we nodding her head. <laughs> And I, I, sorry, I mean, a white paper joke comes to mind. <laughs> There's a video of someone revising the gadget on YouTube. May I share? I don't think you can. Scott can post links, um, but when I log in as my regular self, I don't have any power on this account. I can't post links. So, oh, Tullowit, you went down the road. It was too easy. So a quick search on Newegg turns up a whole bunch of PCIe internal TV tuner cards that also have video capture and they're run, they run about between 40 and $65. So there you go. that makes sense. I mean, I didn't look at it from the, the standpoint of a video capture card, but sure the software that runs it is clearly, uh, it would be crazy not to include capture work. Right. Article, a lot of times with those DVRs, the terms, are, the items, there we go is not even stored on the DVR, but rather pointers to the content on the cloud. You would need to play the file and record again using something like Hopog. Oh man, I remember Hopog from the early 80s. <clears throat> Digging the shirt in the background. In the background, I think I saw it move. Uh, it only moves at night, it does night moves. <laughs> God, <laughs> oh, oh, I'm dying here, dying here. <laughs> <laughs> I win. You win. You win. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> nope, no links coming up. Sorry, buddy. There we go. Might be his win. <laughs> Thank you, article. All right. Well, I'm going to move on to uh, to a project then. I okay. want to do uh, a Wireshark demo, which is the reason that uh, my good lady wife is sitting at her desk. She's going to. Uh, crash her machine and make it uh, start up again so that we can do a, a little DHCP real-time capture. Let's see, I can get rid of this program because that was the only slideshow that I want to do today. So let us connect to a Raspberry Pi that's got Wireshark running, R-A-S-P-V-E-R-R-Y. I think I typoed that R A S P B R R Y. There we go. Now we'll share that. Okay, so we're looking at a current operating system for Raspberry Pi OS. It's on a Raspberry Pi 3B. And I'm going to fire up Wireshark. Really, I am. By the way, this Wireshark looks and acts just like Wireshark if you install it on a PC or any other machine that it's supported on. So I don't know, uh, the, the missus is on wireless. 
The Pi is wired in wireless, so I'm just going to capture from any interface that's connected. And we're going to start a capture up here by clicking the little shark fin. And we are buzzing along. And let me show you something here. Uh, you can see VNC is just moving tremendous amount of data, uh, and we're capturing all of it. So I'm going to tell it not to bother to show me that. So exclamation point means not. And then we'll add VNC. And now all the VNC traffic has gone away visually. There's still a lot of stuff going on. But all right, so I'm going to turn to my misses right now. We're not going to see this happen in real time, but we'll get to it as we go. So misses, if you would go to that uh, open command line window and enter on that command that we set up. And let me know when it returns to the C prompt. All right, so what we've just done right now, we've got a machine on our network here in house. And the missus has typed in the command ipconfig slash release. So now none of her uh, network interface cards have an IP address. And they get them all from a DHCP server that we've got running in the house. So she's now going to run ipconfig slash renew. It's a Windows machine. And hit the enter key anytime you want and tell me when it returns to the C prompt. And it always takes longer to renew than it does to release. I love the pretty colors that go scrolling by here, the yellows and the teals and you've completed. Okay, you can close that window. I'm done with you over there. And I'm gonna stop the capture right now. So somewhere in this miasma of almost 26,000 captured frames Uh, I'm sorry, looking at something that I was experimenting with earlier here, but it's not there. Uh, is a DHCP negotiation. So let's go see if we can find it. Anybody remember the ports that DHCP uses? I can feel you typing them in real quick. And while you're typing them in, I'm going to put it up here. TCP.port equals 67. And hey, the, the upper bar has turned pink. That means that's not a valid filter. Well, OK, what am I screwing up? Uh, DNS also uses port 68. So let's try that. Still pink. What's the problem? Well, here's the problem. When you do a DHCP request and response, you're working with a machine that doesn't have an IP address. If it doesn't have an IP address, it can't do all the cool things that you have to do with TCP, like the three-way handshake and all that other good stuff. So DHCP is a UDP process. So let's try that. UDP.port, you can see I've typed this in before, doing some testing, equals, we use a double equals there, 67. Hey, there we go. We hit the enter key on that. And he searches through. Oh, there's a lot of discovery going on. The thing wasn't getting a response uh, fast enough to make it happy. But let's pick one of the, uh, this one here at the end. So Dora uses this four-part process. It starts with discover. There is some computer out there that doesn't have an IP address. And it says broadcast. See the 255, 255, 255. Trust me, there's another 255 after that. It says, attention, all computers on this network. This is me. I don't have an IP address yet. So my IP, ad my IP address is 0000. But I'm using port 67 or 68, uh, which is discovery. And what I'm doing is I'm calling out. I'm using the discover command in there. Is there a DHCP server? And when a DHCP server hears it, we would see, should see a response that says offer. Yes, I'm a DHCP server and I offer you that IP, uh, here's an IP address. It's not here, I'll get into that in a second. Then that same workstation says, okay, I haven't accepted it yet. I'm still gonna use IP address 0000, but yes, I would like to request that IP address that you're offering to me. And then the last thing we would see, not seeing it here, and again, I'll fix that, 
is acknowledgement. You are now assigned a specific IP address and that completes Dora. And now the DHCP server will make a log entry that says, I've given this IP address to the person with a particular MAC address and it'll be leased or reserved for however long. So we did a bunch of experimenting with this this week. And in other environments where I've done this, we can see the whole Dora process, but not visible here. So I said, there's another way. If you go to, let me cancel this share, let you see my horrible face for a second. I want to take you to another place. Okay, it's over here, it's over here, and then we go over here. If you go to wireshark.org, you'll actually wind up at a place called wiki.wireshark.org. Let me share that. So this is wikiwireshark.org. In fact, this is the main page of it. Let's take you right there. There we go. The Wireshark front page. And down in here under general, right near the top of the page, there is sample captures. This is PCAPs, when, uh, Wireshark captures that people have done, clean them up to just the necessary packets and then save them. They're called PCAP files. They have the extension .pcap. And here are gazillions and zillions and zillions and zillions of PCAP captures. And so if I do a little search on here for DHCP, there's one, dhcp.pcap, a sample of DHCP traffic. So I saved, I copied that down, saved it to a directory in my Wireshark machine. And now we're gonna read it. So I'm gonna take you back to that computer. There we go. And I'm going to do file open. I can do open recent. It's already there, but I'll show you what I did with it. So file open. And I saved it. I used FTP to copy it from my Windows machine to the FTP server in here. So we go down to the DHCP PCAP. And when I say open it, he's going to whine. Hey, what do you want to do about that stuff you just captured? I'll continue without saving it. I don't need it all. And let's get rid of this filter. And all they did was give us the four packets that we needed. So there was the discovery that we should see from unknown source, computer with a, a no IP address, broadcast on DHCP. So that's where port 68 is coming from, from port 67 to port, uh, sorry, Clients use 68, uh, servers use 67. So this is a port 68 client request to a server. Hey, are you out there? And he responds, yes, from port 67 to port 68, I'm out there and I offer you the following IP address, 192.168.0.1. Okay, from port 68 to port 67, I would love to accept that IP address. Okay, acknowledge, it's yours. So that's the DHCP process. Things to walk away from as a, a learning tool are, it's a UDP process, the client broadcasts. Some DHCP servers broadcast everything on the response, some do it as an, an attempted unicast. And the whole process, if we want to learn it in order, is Dora, discover from the client, offer from the server, request from the client, acknowledge from the server. I'm going to control. Now, this will be interesting. I'm going to control Q to get out of here. Normally, when I control Q, before it lets me get out, it says, hey, do you want to quit without saving that stuff? It's already saved. This came from a file. It knows it. So control Q, bam, gone. And that's what it's all about. <laughs> Great. Now we know what song's gonna be in my track. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, come on. That was fun. So that's the kind of thing that you can do with a Wireshark on your own system. Again, set it up on Windows. Uh, and if you set it up on Windows and you do the same lab, uh, you get a little more interesting results because temporarily your machine will be IP addressless and it may gag. It works best with two machines and Wiresharking from the machine that is the DHCP server. Okay, going back to notes, going back to some other page views. Just for the record, Tullowit is avoiding or resisting bad Dora the Explorer puns right now. Just I, you know, even Tullowit can skip low hanging fruit. Kudos, buddy. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, my machine is doing something slightly odd. There we go. I can live with this. All right, going back to pick up a couple of your questions. There we go. Jow says, just look up Opaler Air Duster and YouTube it. Sounds good. <laughs> uh, Andy STL, would 64 to 128 gig micro SD card work for storage on a Pi Media DVR? Yes. If that's big enough to hold all the media that you plan on saving. Uh, you know, 128 gig sounds pretty big until you start saving five gigabyte files, that's a, a two hour movie, then it only takes about 30 movies and you, less than that, and you're out of space. But that's what I'm gonna do today. In fact, I'm gonna do my demo with a 32 gig micro SD card. But uh, be looking at, you know, if you're thinking about something like that, 256 gig flash drives are not very expensive these days. So do a small micro SD to run the server and uh, the Pi operating system on and then save to something that's plugged into USB, like a big flash drive or a really big for real type external hard drive. I see you grinning. There's going to be something funny coming up here. <laughs> Alice is ready in front of Pi. All right. Tell it, when you connect a peripheral via USB to a Pi, do you need to add drivers or does Pi OS contain a lot of drivers. It does contain a lot of drivers, especially if you're talking about peripherals. Sorry, I was getting dry there. Uh, like storage devices. Uh, there are some things if you go out and, and I'm trying to think of a, a particular USB device. I've, I've run into several and I cannot come up with a name offhand, but oftentimes the folks who will sell a device for which there isn't native support in the Linux distro you're using, they have it online with instructions on how to do it. But for most of the things that I mess with, in fact, I was going to show you one, drivers are native. The subject of hats came up on Wednesday, and I believe Tullowit was one of the people who asked about that. This is called a sense hat. Am I holding that up close enough? Sorry, I've got a whole bunch of blockage on, oh God, I almost stopped video. I clicked on something dangerous. There we go. So this is a sense hat. It has a whole bunch of sensors in it. Let me flip over to my list real quick. Uh, these things cost anywhere from 15 to 30 bucks, depending on who you buy it from. Uh, this little row of all the white dots, those are uh, color LEDs. So you can generate output and do really cool things with it. But built into here, is a gyroscope, and in fact, multiple gyroscopes, an accelerometer, a magnetometer, a thermometer, a barometric pressure indicator, and a humidity sensor. And it's a hat. It's designed to go on. It's a 40-pin hat. Uh, and the only pie that I've got out here handy dandy only has uh, 24 pins on it. But we plug into a, a modern pie, and it can stack right up. And there are drivers in here for this thing. So all you've got to do is do a little coding and say, I want to turn on this sensor and I want to read the input. There are programs to generate output on the little grid. So that part's very cool. And Tullowit also asked, I'm pretty sure it was Tullowit, if you can stack hats. The answer to that is not only yes, but certainly. And let me show you something ever so cool along those lines. I'm OCD, I gotta wrap everything up and stick it back in its original box and its original casing and close the box. <laughs> so this, there, this isn't a hat because it doesn't exactly match the dimensions of the thing and it doesn't negotiate, but this is a stack of five 
stackable interfaces that's designed to run. Hey, I got a wire nut missing off there. It must be in my magic box there. Uh, programmable strings of RGB LEDs. So I can plug this onto one Pi and this isn't the limit. This Pi that I have here could be a dozen or two dozen. There's not enough power in the Pi to run all of this stuff. That's what the red and black wires are for. So you add external power, you can tie them all together. Cool. But just super cool. All right, catching up on questions. Not too much to catch up on. Yeah, not too many questions. You know, for somebody who's not doing Dora the Explorer references, the first line is Dora the Explorer reference. It's not a pun, but yeah. Dave Zientera, nice to see you again. We did it. <laughs> I'm not sure which we uh, it is. Was that a, a test pass or you made it to Pi Day Drama or something else? Jow's Balin, see you Monday. Okay, we'll see you Monday. Dinner time in Portugal. <laughs> yeah. Greg Davis, I was actually singing the Stinkin' Door of the Explorer song my daughter used to watch. I am so grateful that my kid was too old for Dora by the time it came out. So yeah, that's the one I was song. laughing at. <laughs> Just the, the raw disgust in his <laughs> written tone. <laughs> for any of you old enough, I was around when uh, I was a young adult, an early adult, when uh, Barney the Dinosaur was out. And I, I abuse him mightily. All right, cool. So yeah, just because it's stackable doesn't mean it's a hat. Hats have some specific parameters. They have to be the right size and shape. And among their importance is they have to have a chip that, that can negotiate features okay, uh, between the Pi and the device. But everybody calls stuff that plugs into it a hat, even if it's an incorrect term. Okay, hey, perfect. First hour goes exactly when and where it was supposed to. Let's talk Plex servers. All right. Yahoo. So as mentioned, can be done on same box as a Cody server, can be done on as a separate box. And we don't even need to get Cody into the mix. You can just use a standalone Plex server as a media server. Remember there's three uh, free services on there, movies and videos and storage and the other thing. And then for the premium service, there's streaming audio along the lines of Spotify or Pandora or something like that. And my thunder was already stolen here. Uh, I think Andy asked uh, about the size. So my little notes here, I'm gonna use a stock micro SD card, 32 gigs, but it would be better when you start thinking about how big movies and such are to use an external drive plugged into your Plex box, uh, like an external hard drive or at least a big flash drive. So our goal today, set up the Plex server and configure it. Okay. There's a three step thing that we need to accomplish between today and next week. Install and configure Plex, set up a browser that can use Plex. And you see what I mean when we get there, there's, there's a, a, a real surprise. And that's the thing that threw me late last night when I was ready to test. And then next week we'll integrate the Kodi and the Plex server. Okay. What I wanna do, I'm gonna show this to you two times more if you want. I got a little bit of a, a cheat sheet for you, let's call it that. In order to set up a Plex server, it should be really easy. You should just be able to type in sudo apt install Plex and it happens. But they're not all like that, unfortunately. That's how we set up Wireshark. And then there was one little minor step afterward, but not the case here. Oh, wrong thing to share, silly lad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As I said, man, I do not love Zoom. 
It's okay. I like it, but I don't love it because you have to do funky things. All right. So I'm putting this up here so that when you're watching this tomorrow, because I know you want to see this again, you'll be able to pause and write this stuff down or type it down. I'll show this again later at the end. And if you're checking this out on the archive, good stuff. So there are tutorials on how to do things. And I tried a whole bunch of different ones. And I finally found one that I was happy with that's relatively straightforward and quick and painless. There is, there's no three-step commands to install a Plex server on a Raz Pi. You've got to run through a handful of steps. And they don't take too long. But this is the tutorial that I used uh, as my primary reference. And I made one or two minor mods. It's on linuxize.com. Later, when you get it installed, it's a web application. So you're going to access it by firing up a web browser on the same machine as your Plex server. And this is where you're going to go to make it happen. So we'll use, you can see it's not secure. It's not HTTPS. I'm either, you, you can either use the loopback address or the name of the Pi that you're installing it on. And then there's an alternate port. Instead of using port 80 or port 443, it uses port 32,400 and so forth. And then finally, this is a method to get digital rights management supported on the web browsers that are available on the Raz Pi. If you're using uh, a, a PC, with a browser in it and all the standard browsers, Internet Explorer, did I say that? Internet Explorer, Edge, Firefox, Mozilla, Chrome, and of course, currently the best one out there, Brave. They all have built-in digital rights management and you can watch things through tabs that are rights managed. That used to be the case in Raspi, but that was drawn out of the, the one that they support natively and even in Firefox, when you download the current version of Firefox that works on Raspi, it doesn't support DRM and the feature that used to be turn onable is gone. So I tried for so many hours last night to find a good way to make it work that's quick and simple and painless. And this is finally the one that I found. It works like a dream. It's current as of today's publication. So useful stuff down road. 15.02, time for a sip. Oh, tea. Do you guys have fuzzies? Is that a, a Texas or a regional thing? It's a taco shop. All those fuzzies around here in my neighborhood have closed as a result of pandemic and some of them before that. Okay. Notes. The pandemic has definitely been hard on the uh, food and beverage industry. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Lord a lot of the restaurants in my neighborhood are closed as well. I cut you off. Start again, Scott. Did a lot of a lot of the restaurants in my neighborhood have closed. Just you know, how do you stay in business when you don't have customers? Right, because you're in a, a lovely neighborhood that doesn't have a lot of chain restaurants. It's got you know little standalone hole in the wall kind of places. Yeah, that's tough to keep those things going when there's not many people visiting. Uh, yeah, I'm not gonna do that. Sorry. Okay. So I'm using the Linux size process. It has two main parts. One is the installation and the second is the configuration. And I'm just gonna walk, talk through. Some of these commands are ugly, long and involved. And I'm gonna explain most of them as we go. Um, you can obviously watch me do them as we do this, but you're gonna need that Linux size website to get all of these steps documented. When I get done, I will create a document uh, as I have for many of our labs, uh, we're still trying to find the right place to put them and make them accessible for you. And, I, and that will happen. All right, so let's go back and share our server. <clears throat> Excuse me. And all of the installation is done from the command line. It should be pretty visible. I played around a lot with this yesterday. There we go. That's a good place to do this. So step number one, you've got to do a pseudo apt update and a pseudo apt upgrade. 
that's a little time consuming. So not surprisingly, I did that this morning before we ever uh, got started here. So the next step is to install a certificate to be used on a uh, repository that's not a normal repository. So I'm gonna say sudo apt install, and then all this happy junk is going to go to a particular place and get certificates. I hit the enter key, this one's a, a fairly quick process. There's only two process that uh, are long in here and I'm mostly gonna do them or have done them in advance. Do I wanna continue? Yes, I do. Because it's gonna use a whole 149K. Well, that's happened, I'll get the next command ready. All right, now the repository that we're gonna use is a secure repository. So we know, when you, we know that whenever you do anything secure, there has to be a key exchange, right? I need somebody's public key, they need my public key. We're gonna use a key system. I'm looking at my own, I mean, here's a question I've, I've never asked anybody. Let me see if I can do this uh, as I segue for just a second. So as I look at the feed on YouTube, I see myself and Scott in the upper right hand corner. Does everybody see that? Scott, do you see that on the YouTube? On, on Zoom, I see both of us. On yeah. YouTube, I only see the speaker. Okay. All right, well, that works for me. <laughs> so I disappear when you're talking. Okay. Now, if I stop talking and you talk. Then I appear. Okay. So it's that trigger. All right, so as long as one or both of us is on there at the same time, I'm a happy guy. All right, so we're gonna use a key that's part of the Linux common system stuff called a GPG key. GPG stands for GNU Privacy Guard. And interestingly, GPG is part of the PGP suite, reverse those letters, the pretty good privacy suite. It's a uh, it's a protocol that's been around for a very long time. It's not just Linux oriented. It's been uh, living in the internet world for a very long time. So let me show you how we're going to do the key nonsense here. Let me do a clear on here. Right click, paste. So curl basically means go out to some site and pull a script, an image or whatever. So it's gonna to go to downloads.plex.tv and some folder, it's gonna find the plex, dot, uh, plex sign dot key, and then it's going to sudo apt install it. There's an interesting situation. Now my handy dandy little picture is covering up the rest of that text, but it's going to install it. And oh, this, okay, so when you do this, if and when you do this from the instructions that are on uh, the Linux size website, there is, a dash at the end of the line, and it's not the correct dash, it's a hyphen. So copy and paste that line into here, backspace over whatever character is there, and then just use the minus key on your keyboard. Otherwise you'll get an error and you won't be able to continue. Bam. And so we go buzz, buzz, grind, grind, and it's done. Now I don't have any Plex installed in this machine, so you're gonna see everything the way it's supposed to be. At the end, I, if there's a, a long process that bites me a little bit, I've got one installed on another micro SD card and Scott will talk while I install that. All right, so we've got a key that allows us to get to this encrypted repository. Next. And you knew, you knew that HTTPS, that URL, because of the uh, Linux eyes walkthrough. Right? right, I'm just copying and pasting it from there. Obviously, I've copied and pasted it into my outline, but you can do it directly from the site. Okay. All right, this is now going to extract some information from their repository and add it to my machine. Bam, that was quick. I love how quick this, some of this stuff goes. So that's the Echo Deb. Deb is the package manager. 
All right, once the Plex, or the Plex repository, so we've enabled the Plex repository. That command showed us that we're able to access it. So we got the right GPG key. So here's the longest thing that I'm gonna do with you. It's a two minute thing. I'm gonna try and run it without doing sudo. Oh no, I gotta do this. So we gotta do a sudo apt update. You can do apt get. So that's gonna update all the repository information, the ones that I was always using in the past and the new one that we've just added. And I'm doing two commands here that collectively take two minutes. So let me come out from undercover for a second. I'll unshare briefly while that happens. Hey, long time no see. And yeah, that's it. Then the final thing we're gonna do is verify. This is actually, we've. This will complete the installation, believe it or not. And you don't see much of anything in the process. Okay, it's still buzzing and grinding. Hey, it's done. <laughs> Let me take you right back there. So we haven't really done many steps here and they've all been very quick. As long as you follow those things step-by-step step and finish, fix that minus problem. Last command here is to reset the server if it's necessary and to see if it's running. And see the uh, system control status. Show me the status of the Plex Media server. Enter. I missed this step, I think, because this works like a champ. What a... Oh, I did miss a step. I did the update, but I forgot this. We didn't install the server. That would help. So now we can. So now we do a sudo apt or apt get install Plex Media Server, and it will reach out to the Plex website uh, repository and do the install. And again, it's fairly quick, less than two minutes. And I'm going to stick around here. 63. I watched this last night when I was doing this. This number is always less than this number. So now it's downloaded all the stuff, a grand 71 megs. And now we're going to see it install it into Linux. This part hangs on for a long time. It parks at 20%. Then it speeds up. And then we're going to get prompted with a question that's got a lot of possible answers. And it's a very easy one to answer. Buzz, buzz, grind, grind, take your time. All right, I'll come out. I'll take you back to when it gets to the question. All right. Anything popping up on questions while we wait for that, Scott? Uh, no. Excellent. Everybody's wrapped <laughs> watching in, in grand rapture. Yeah, we did have a lot of uh, back and forth on uh, some childhood torment and torture. <laughs> Tales, Barney, Teletubbies. I'd forgotten about that. You know, I was going to make a Teletubbies reference. I let it go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Greg uh, has a couple of folks out there know uh, a Brit show. The question's up, but I'm gonna, since I started this segue, I'm going to do it. Uh, there's a Britcom called Vicar of Dibley. If you have those of you who know the show and, and already know where I'm going with this. But those of you who haven't, go check it out sometime. You've got this marvelous little ditzy character on there uh, who's very childlike, but she's an adult. Uh, and she does her wedding on the big day with Teletubbies theme. And it's just one of the most hilarious episodes of a Britcom that you may ever see. You, close. Stop making noise. You, share. <laughs> How is that possible? I got two different noises on two different devices at the same time, weird. Okay, so we're at the 40% mark now. And there's a question here, the default action, well, let's say, let's file on the system is created by you or by a script, file on the package and provided maintainer. The short version of what's going on here is there are two files that are gonna be the same, one that pre-existed on your Raspi and one that Plex server wants to put on. 
and the default action is to keep the one that's on your current system. That's a good default. I've tried all these other ones. You can see there's yes or install, no or uh, O, same answers. D, show the differences. If you do the D, uh, they're actually blank files, so there's really nothing to show. So it doesn't matter, especially since this is a default install. So I'm just gonna hit the enter key because the default equals no. Let's try that again. Enter, there we go. And the installation completes pretty quickly. Okay, this time I'm not lying as much. It's Plex server is now installed, but it needs a bunch of configuration. I'm going to go up to that command that failed earlier because I hadn't actually installed it. And we just ran this sudum system control status. And long and short version is I'm looking for this active running. So this is a running Plex server. It's not doing anything yet, but there we go. I can do page down from here. I'm already at the end of it, nothing to do. So I hit the Q command because it's just reading a text file and bam, we're installed. So now I'm gonna go back to my Linux size tutorial. Step one is now complete. It had four sub steps and a couple of them had two commands. Part two is configuring the Plex media server. So before doing that, the, this particular tutorial recommends that we create a folder or more than one folder where we're gonna save saved content. So let me show you a really cool command. I have showed you a little bit about this command in the past, but this one's got a neat little aspect to it. We'll do clear here. And I'm gonna right click paste what I copied. All right, so sudo, because we're gonna work in a place when Plex Media set it up, it's stuff, it created a new user account whose name is Plex, not surprisingly. And we're gonna have to give ownership of all this stuff to Plex. So I gotta use sudo until that happens. We're gonna make a directory and we're gonna in fact make multiple directories at the same time. It's gonna be off the root in a folder called opt. It's gonna make a subfolder there called Plex Media. And then check this out. It's gonna make two folders underneath there, one called movies and one called series. Let me prove this to you. I'm going to cd slash opt and I'm going to ls. So right now there is no Plex Media folder. Let me get out of there. I'm going to run this command just like we supposed to. Clear. So I'm proving that you don't have to be in that folder to do what I'm about to do. I've gone back to my home folder. Buzz, buzz, grind, grind, all done. So now if I do an ls of opt, there's Plex Media, the new folder. And if we go look in that folder, hey, cool. There's two new simultaneously created folders. If you're not thinking of a prank right now, Tolowit, on how to do a little script and have somebody make 50,000 folders <laughs> with one little script, then you're not the person I think you are. The next thing we've got to do is give ownership of that folder to the created account Plex. So again, it doesn't matter where you are when you do this. I can say here in my home folder, that I'm going to say sudo change owner minus cap R to a user called Plex for the folder called Plex Media. That means Plex will own everything in and under opt Plex Media. Bam, done. You know, most Linux commands, if you mess them up, they'll give you an error message. If you don't mess them up, you see what you're seeing here. Yep, blank results. I'm not gonna give you error message. So take it on faith that it worked. Now, what I wanna do here is I want to put some movies in there, some short movies that I made earlier. Uh, I'm going to do that with a separate window, so I don't have to do this later. I can do this uh, in another shell. So give me just a second. This isn't part of the instructions. It's not something you have to do, but it's going to be good for my demo. 
So I'm going to go into FTP slash files ls start on mp4. Okay, I'm going to copy star.mp4. Oh, I might have to do sudo because pi might not have access to that folders. This is something I didn't test last night. Uh oh. <laughs> you know, if it doesn't work, everything else I'm going to do work. So I didn't really care. Uh, opt, flex media, movies. Okay, no error messages. Let me make sure it's going to start and then I'll go back to the other window. Yeah, I can keep an eye on it. All right, so that's the background test. Now I'm back to the uh, Linux size instructions. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to open up a browser and we're going to access this web app. Let me copy this so I can make it easier on my life. We will shrink this guy. In fact, I don't need the terminal anymore. Hey, that's all done. They've all copied. Let's check it. Opt, Plex Media, Movies. And they're there. Got three movies in that folder. They're short. OK, so we're going to open up. Now, here's something that I did in advance. And I'll show you how to do it. Pi comes with a Chromium web browser. You can access it here. You can access it up here. But the Chromium web browser doesn't support digital rights management. So I had to do some magic and create another version of it. It's actually the same version, but it has some additional pieces added to it called the Chromium DRM web browser. You don't need that until you're ready to actually watch a show or a movie. So I could do what we're going to do with the regular one, but I'm going to use this guy because that's going to save me some bookmarking and account creating and stuff like that later. Yes, Chromium boots up really fast. Chromium is Chrome. It's Chrome for Linux. And when I was messing with this thing last night, I, I, would, I just went through so many different attempts at fixing it. There were five different methods that I tried. And then I tried mixing and matching those methods. And at some point, I wound up having to downgrade Chromium and then try all this stuff, hoping that would work with older versions. And that didn't work. And then re-upgrading it. And ah, oh, it was just nightmarish. For you, I have a one shot, works the first time. Everything is cool. Oh, aren't you sneaky? Let me go get that again. Oh, I'll get it from here. You know, it's funny, exactly the same thing happened to me when I did this the first time last night. I copied it, I thought, set it up to paste into here, and it said, no, I'm going to take you to this location. There we go. Okay, right click, paste. There we go. That looks right. All right, so I'm going to HTTP, and the IP address of the server is one method. The name of the server is one method, uh, but I'm going to use the loopback, 127.0.0.1. There's a colon there. There's the port, and there's a web. And that's just the instructions that come from Linux size. So here we go. Enter. So again, the Plex server is a web app. It's not a standalone program like Cody is and some of the other media servers. Do take your time. First time boots up a little slower. Which Pi are you installing? Did you install this on? This is on a 3B. And having played with it as much as I did, I'm going to do this again on a Pi 4. And I will report back if the additional memory makes an improvement. But we'll be able to see in the statistics how much memory is required. 
I really expect this to come up much faster. It also may come from the fact that I've got an old slow micro SD card in there compared to the fast ultra sand disk that I used last night. I know you can almost see that, but it's orange. Sand disk ultras are orange. And I'll bet you that the one that I have in there is one of those $3 specials from Micro Center. So there's a lot of interesting things going on here. If you pay attention to this top, you can see that it has phoned home. It's actually called real app.plex.tv. The first time you do this, you've got to create an account. You can use your favorite here, use Google, use Facebook, Apple. So I'm going to say continue with email. Even if you don't have an account, this is how you do it. And if you don't have an account, you go down here and you sign up with email and that'll take you to a place to make a, uh, an email address entry and a password. I made one last night, so I'm going to use the one I made. Here's a stunner. So now everybody knows the name of my Plex server account, but fortunately it hides the password. What was the password again? <laughs> when I put that in, it called it medium week or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'll save the password. I have discovered that that didn't really do much. Every time I went back in here, I still had to retype it in. This is cool. We got a Plex server, but it's not going to do anything yet. Now we're back to working on my own machine. Now we're back to loopback 127.001. You say got it on this first page. And now it's time to set it up. So let me go check and see what the destruction say so you can follow along the same way that you would. Once you sign up, you have your registered page, click got it. So step number one says, Allow me to access outside my home. You can check that and click next. If you're not comfortable with that, then don't do it. Oh, this is the advertising page. I got to get out of here. Okay, so it's check mark here. Allow me to access my media outside my home. So you don't have to do port forwarding in your router. This thing calls Plex server and when you're out outside of the house, you can call the Plex server and access your internal Plex server. You, can get, uh, you call the commercial Plex server headquarters at Plex.tv, and it will redirect when you log in to your internal Plex server. Is that cool or what? That's totally cool. That is totally cool. So now when I'm in the Plex server, I'm going to give it my name. Or it's totally dangerous, right? Uh, heck, I'm going uh, to call it... Uh, Drama Plex. Drama Plex. Really, I am. There's no dash there. Dash D Rush TX. And click next. And while that's nexting, I'll go check the next step here. Okay, next we're going to add libraries. There's so a weird little thing that happens in the add libraries where it looks like you've done it, but you've got to click another thing. So you'll see what I mean. We click add library. And I'm going to pick one for movies because we made a movies folder. Movies is a pretty good name for it. Next. And now we've got to go and tell it where, which folder I want to put my movies in. So it was WAC opt, WAC Plex Media, WAC Movies. And you could browse for it. Add library. Isn't that what I've been doing? And I have to add library again. That's the weird, funky thing. Or maybe I'm just not waiting long enough.
You go check and make sure I'm not missing something. Again, could just be the slow micro SD card. Library type, browse for media folder, optplex media movies, click the add, and then the add library. And we can do more libraries here once we're done with that. There we go. I don't think I have to do this again, but I'm going to. No. So now if you wanted to go make uh, a TV shows library, we made that series folder and you can make them at whatever other kind. So we're done with that. We've added all of our libraries. We next. And we're done. There's apps here that you can add to it. And are you ready, kids? We've installed a Plex server and we have configured it. So what we're looking at now is the home screen of our Plex server. He's gone out and is reading the movie and TV show and stuff that's all downloadable and viewable from Plex.tv, somewhere up there in the cloud. Oh, I think it remembers where I was last time. And I want a full list here. I don't want the channels menu. So let me go back and see what happens. Reading, reading, reading. Shows, all shows, recommended web shows. Oh, I went to web shows. That's not what I wanted. So this is a little slow. This would work faster on a standard machine, but I believe that the slowness is coming from a slow micro SD card, not from the fact that Plex is slow or that the, the Pi is particularly slow. I don't want to go premium. Movies and TV, there we go. Oh, come on, you should see all those movies. <laughs> Untested, huh? Weird. Okay, fine, we'll do it on the homepage. But I found when I was on the homepage yesterday that it didn't show me the exactly the same list of what's on the home uh, movies and TV. I wish Brandon was here and he'd poke in some info. This hamburger menu doesn't do anything other than collapse or open this management pane. So we've got some uh, categories here of things. I'm gonna uh, pick. I'm gonna pick something here that uh, just at random, just to see if we can actually make sure that this thing is running and that the uh, the fix works. And then I'm gonna show you how to do that browser fix. And that's gonna be it for today. It's, it's not real complicated. If somebody isn't clicking and then explaining everything they do for six minutes at a crack, you can do this all in about 15 minutes. I'm looking for something in particular here. Let's try filming TV. All right, you guys all know Archer. I didn't try Archer last night, but let's see what happens. <laughs> we were doing this demo on Cody last week. We we watched five seconds of I Love Lucy or something, and I got a, a, a message posted from one of the folks in the background who said, hey, take that off. We're liable to get pulled off the screen pretty soon here. <laughs> That's very true, actually. Yeah, but I think for what we were doing, it was incidental. Oh, this is a trailer. I have to suffer through the trailer. So when I try to do this without the DRM thing, it would always hang up a couple seconds into the trailer. Oh God, I could suffer through more of these. You get the idea. You can hunt through here at your convenience. 
find stuff, control stuff. And I'm not going to, I'll do a, a, a more serious tour next week when I figure out this other thing. And hopefully Brendan will be there, but cool bananas. Let me show you the last piece of this. You know what? Here, let's go into Crackle. Because that's where I was experimenting last night. I've got a uh, a bit. Of oh, what's a what's Crackle again? I'm sorry. What's Crackle? Crackle again? is a content provider. It's owned by Sony, I believe, and they have 80 different on-demand and live channels of stuff. I'm trying to shrink this so I can get this thing. There we go. Full screen or full view. All right, so you can see Crackle's got a bunch of categories of stuff here. I don't know what the sounds of summer are. Movies with summer themes, probably. Crackle comedies. Oh, God. They have The Tick. Follow it. You better love The Tick. And everybody else, you're forgiven if you don't. The cartoon version is a million times better than the live action. But I love The Tick cartoon. All right, you get the idea. Again, I'm not going to go turn on another show here. It works. Let me show you what it takes to make your browser work. And I did it all in advance. Let's go sign out of here. Because that's part of my obsessive compulsive disorder. And I'll come back face to face for a minute for you while I prep that. Cool. So just take a couple seconds because I'm going to show you I'm not going to do the whole thing. But explaining it is really cool. At least for me, you know, when you're a dweeb. The, the now, tick, tick jokes go ahead. Are coming up. What do you got about tick? The tick jokes are coming up. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, so we've, oh, you know what? There was one more thing I had to do. We'll go back into there and, and do that. I want to go see the movies uh, that we put in our movie library. I don't know how. Because, again, I didn't experiment with that last night, but we'll sure find out. And that's going to be important next week when we use Cody to access the Plex library. Okay, so let me show you something. <laughs> Just two simple things. These are some documented failures. Perfect, right? Everybody should see Dave's failures. But this is... What looked like, it's never, it wasn't really number one, it was probably about number five or six. In order for modern browsers, almost all of them, to support digital rights management, they all use this same support man uh, module. It's called Widevine CDM. And if your browser doesn't come with it, cool, you install it. And so that was what the whole project was about, trying to find ways of installing Widevine into there. So here was one that I started out without having to, is this the one that downgraded it? Oh no, this one's really cool. This one turns your browser, it gives it a menu that allows it to pretend to be another kind of browser and includes the wide wide CDM. So you can see what all is involved here. We had to do a wget, that thing goes out to some server and downloads stuff on there that's organized as if it would be already on your computer. And then we install it into the browser. And this caused the browser to downgrade from 1.0 to browser 0.56. It's years old. And it failed. So I wasn't worried about it because I installed Firefox. And OK, so if I got an outdated version of Chromium, fine, big deal. So then I tried this one. Go here and download this extension and install it. And then you had to plug in some of these values into the extension. And the whole thing failed, and it took forever to do. So I mean, and then upgrading back to more normal Chromium, just gag like crazy. So try this guy. 
He had a really simple thing, two steps, run this command, run this command, reboot the Pi, and it works. You go to it the same way we go to this that I've shown you now. We click on the application menu up here. We pick internet and there's a Chromium medium, media edition. Didn't work, so much for real simple. And as I said, I tried a whole bunch of other goodies and none of them worked until I found this amazing piece of technology. I'll show it to you on my uh, actual highlight here. And this is, well, here, you know what? Let's do this to remind everybody. This came from here and it's only got a couple of steps, very easy to follow along with. Come down here to Liebchen. So how to create a version of Chromium that supports DRM. It's on this website called Lamariva, Lamariva, you pronounce it, make you happy. Uh, and it's a very, very simple website or set of instructions. So let me show you the instructions. I could take you to the page, but it's a lot easier to show you here. Okay, there's the Lemariva. So what it's gonna do is it downloads a simple little script. I got a 32-bit version of Raspberry Pi OS running on here. So I ran this wget command. There's no spaces here. If you got a 64-bit version of Raspberry Pi OS, then you run this command. So it's a really simple script. Downloads in four seconds. And then you have to make it executable. You chmod it to x. Here's the name of the actual script that got downloaded. And then you run it. All you got to do is type sudo and this command right after you've done this. So the whole thing is three commands. Run this command, run this command, run this command. And that's the fun part. Because what that script does, <laughs> let me bring you up to my face. Chromium is a version of Chrome that's designed to run on Linux systems. Now there's a couple different versions. Some that run on Ubuntu and, uh, Ubuntu is not the right answer. Some that run on Linux distros that run on an AMD or an in it, Intel processor. And they make versions that run on an ARM processor such as you find in here. Well, they, of course, Google makes Chrome OS. And in their Chrome OS, they have a CDN, so a, a, a DRM supportive version of Chromium. And what this thing does is really nuts. If you were to smoke your Chrome OS on your Chromebook, you could go and download an image of the original operating system into back in your Chrome OS and restore it back to original. Well, that's what this does. It goes out and it gets the backup copy of Chrome OS that's designed to run on devices that have an ARM on them. The download, depending on your download, is, is somewhere between one and two gigs. I, I did it twice yesterday to test it, and they both happen with one gig. So it doesn't take long. It takes between 10 and 15 minutes. Then what it does is it sucks out the DRM components of that backup image and installs it into your local Chromium and then it deletes that one or two gigs worth of backup so you get all your space back. And then it creates this. That's wild. Isn't that nuts? I've looked at that after all my other failures and said, oh my gosh, this is gonna take forever. And the fact that it only took 15 minutes was a stunner and thank goodness. So now, Oops, I just ran the regular Chromium standby while it fails. It's not going to fail. It's going to come up and it wouldn't run Plex server. And in fact, it does run Plex server very well until you finally click on something that you want to watch. And then it says, gives you some kind of boxy message about rights failure or something funky like that. So we go over here to the application menu. I did some research. This button has a name. It's called the application menu. 
we get down to internet. And normally when you do a fresh install of Raspberry Pi OS, there's only three entries in here, Chromium, Claws. In fact, it's only two because we've added the VNC. We also added Wireshark and now it has added the Chromium DRM browser. So it works like a dream. It's simple. It's not too time consuming. As long as you got one or two gigs of free space on your micro SD card, and you certainly should, it's done. And with that, let me close this guy. We'll do a quick review of what we did today and then go look at questions and kill some time for the last 15 minutes. So I have a question for you. Please do. When, uh, when you were initially showing the uh, screens, that show the movies from Plex TV. Yes. That were available. Yes. Uh, it was stuttering a lot. Is that okay, a normal two, behavior? Right. right. So it wasn't actually. That's actually the way that particular screen looked. Um, but yeah, it does run slower because of the, the slower micro SD card. And yeah. I suspect more memory will help a little bit. As I said, I'll try this this week on a Raspi 4 and see if that helps. The okay. Raspi 4 is a little faster than the Raspi B, but I have seen this work very successfully uh, on a number of them. It's smooth. It runs fine. And the show that I watched last night, uh, I watched the full episode of Third Rock from the Sun, the first one. It was cool. And it was absolutely smooth and clean and clear. So it may also be the fact that we're coming through VNC and then coming through Zoom. Right. So we're asking okay. for a, a lot there. Okay, did that, did that, did that. So I'll create a document for this for everybody to go through the whole thing step by step uh, and, and find a place to put that up. But again, all, as long as you check out those three websites, that's everything you need. And, and it's very clear. The only thing that doesn't work perfectly is that dash to minus thing. And you've been warned. Did that, did that, did that. Oh, and the other neat thing, horrible thing, is the VNC does not transport audio. So had everything gone as smoothly as I'd hoped, you wouldn't have heard anything, but that's the NC. If you've got this thing plugged in with an HDMI cable to your monitor, your television, audio comes through just fine. Okay. So what we do today, we did two things. We used Wireshark and checked out a couple of DHCP sessions, one live, that didn't come out as well as I'd hoped, but that there's some kind of limitation on my network or my DHCP server or whatever. But we covered our bases by downloading a DHCP PCAP file from wireshark.org. And we looked at the whole thing there. And then we installed a Plex server. We did some basic configuration on it. We did a very limited amount of exploration on it. I'll get everything cleaner and, and happier for next week's show. And next week's show, Plex and Cody together, very, very quick and simple. All we got to do is add an add-on to Cody. That's the Plex add-on. It's the official one. It comes from Plex. And a simple bit of configuration in there. What's the IP address of your Plex server and where you want to keep the folders? And it's done. So we got lots of time to do cool stuff next week. Cool. Questions. Oh, there haven't been too many questions. So I finished off at 2.38. Uh, maybe a little farther than that. Alice is in front of her pie. Here's the peripheral question. Andy's asking the in 67 and 68 from when I asked that. Oh, here we go. Slid down. Did its thing. Good Lord. That was a door of the Explorer reference. Yes, I see. <laughs> that was Joe leaving. There's Dora. All right, I'm picking it up at 257. Oh, God, it's Barney. No, I'm not. I'm ignoring Barney with a vengeance. <laughs> Here we go. A jockey. Okay. Will Wireshark work if you want to see the public IP on the router? Okay. Took me a second there to put it all together. No, Wireshark works on the local network. So it doesn't cross routers. You need uh, another box like Nmap. Nmap can cross routers. If you want to see traffic that is not 
targeted specific for the machine that's running Wireshark or broadcast traffic or multicast traffic, the way to do that, this is going to go way above and beyond anything, and I'm not going to do a whole shindig on this, but you need a managed switch. And what you do in the managed switch is you create what's called a mirror port. You pick one of the ports, uh, and it'll be the one that's connected to a Wireshark machine, and then you can redirect, not redirect, mirror any inbound or outbound traffic from any port that you specify on the switch to also go out that mirror port. And that's how you capture traffic from the rest of the network. That's also eavesdropping. So it's not something you know that you ought to be doing uh, by sneaking into the company router and having everybody's traffic redirected to you. That's something that's got to be done with corporate and legals buy-in and all that stuff. But no, we can't run Wireshark and capture traffic outside of our local network. Dang it. <laughs> I just made five cents, but uh, out of force of habit, I had clicked on something that I didn't want to. Okay, I'm back in biz. Oh, here's what we can do. Tulowitz talking to Davis. Ajake didn't hear this answer, had to go. <laughs> Article, I want to say no regarding seeing routers traffic. You got that for me. Thank you, right. Article. Art gal, perhaps? Don't know. Interconversation, interconversation. Did you get this one from Tullowit uh, about local economies devastated? Oh, yeah. I, I did, yeah. Figured you would. Lots of just you, Dave. What's that from? Hello, it says just you, just you, Dave. When when you asked if both of us were showing up on the YouTube. Got it. Okay. What happens when you have the memory of a fruit fly? <laughs> ah, you've upgraded this week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My gnat is getting better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, absolutely, Andre. If you don't have three monitors, I've only got one here because of space. Yeah, I, I feel claustrophobic with one monitor. Thank goodness for my office machine if we ever get there. Even when I go on the road, I'll take an extra monitor for my hotel room. That's how I bad I do the same. If I teach a class, I got to have another monitor in the hotel room. The laptop one and a real one. Yes, Tullowit. So, you know, we've been pushing that forever. You got to pick up a Raspi to practice Linux skills. And of course, no, you don't. You can always set up a, a, an Ubuntu virtual machine or something like that. But I think this is a great way to go because it's fun when you're, as you get those Linux skills developed, you can do lots more cool things with it. Andre and Greg, Greg and Andre. Greg's just flexing on with us. We should capture all of this and just make a, a Tullowit log, a, a pun blog. Scripting as a service. There are so many as a services. I like that it, that you've included the SCR, not just SAS. <laughs> John Lehman, welcome, my friend. Good to see you again. And we're almost at the end. Dave also likes Britcoms. Yeah, IT crowd. I don't like Doc Martin. Mike loves Doc Martin. It's just not my cup of mud. I liked Murder in Paradise when it had the first cast and then later the second cast. After that, there was so many cast changes out, it became a parody of itself. It's terrible. Although two inspectors ago, it did have the, uh, the guy from My Hero, the old 70s Britcom. And that was pretty cool, maybe 80s. Dr. Quinn, could you send me a copy of your book, Raspberry Pi Private Tutoring for Dummies? <laughs> there are really good books out there, and I would love to have the time to write one or do a, a, a video series. Well, you kind uh, of are. <laughs> that's a new face for me, or my short memory misses it. So, Theodore S. I'm going to get that right. He's going to come back and say, thanks, Dave. You're one of the few guys who doesn't say Theodore in the U.S. I'm going with Theodore. So, Theodore, uh, Theodore <laughs> I'm blowing it right off the bat. I'm running Wireshark and filler filtering the ICMAP. I'm going to hope that me uh, you're going with ICMP data. Yeah, he, he corrected that later. From IP addresses from Poland and India. Uh, India. What about that? 
Yeah. So you're being uh, attacked, uh, or at least you're being probed for vulnerabilities. So there are bots out there that run 24 hours a day. They, they pick an IP address and they probe it they, with all the possible probey commands. They try and hit it with a port 80 request and a 443 request and ICMP request. So they're, they're just looking for anything that answers on your machine and that will get logged and either the bot that's using it will, uh, the owner of that will use that directly or they sell that in bundles to hackers who want to start, try to hack a vulnerable machine. So good reason to have good firewalls up. Very nice. Hey, there was the correction, ICMP. Transplant, greetings. Just landed at airport. Guess I get to listen late. That's okay. You punched in at 3.53, so you get a full seven minutes. We have five left. Hello, Marvin. Yeah, good idea for Dr. Quinn. And that catches up on questions for the win. It was a 17-page note, but <laughs> I've done that before and run long, but I knew this one would go better. All right, any other questions? Or should Scott and I just banter? We'll throw up the contact info again and the special info. I'm going to start with that and see if any questions come up. So if you guys would like to contact us, us this contact us, us outside of the YouTube chat, you can do so right here. You can shoot me uh, an email to my office. It'll forward to my personal address. So Dave R. Total Sam, or send it straight to my personal address. Don't send it to both. Um, I have a little bit of work to do this weekend, but I will be steaming. So maybe you catch me on as Blood Rush TX or Scott as Scarhart. And of course, you can send a message to Scott. So questions that didn't get answered here, questions that would take a long time to answer, anything else that you want to ask us, answer might be no, like the, the lovely gent who asked for our uh, key to join <laughs> the Zoom seminar. The answer to that may be no, but mostly, if we don't have the answer, we really love this stuff. We do the research. We roundtable it between Mike and Michael and Scott and I and some of the other folks in-house uh, and try and come up with a, a good, clear, concise answer. Tell them about some specials, Scott. So just because you're here this week and in this feed, uh, we have special deals for you at totalsim.com. 50% off all the A plus and net plus super bundles. The super bundles are the videos, the practice tests, and the simulations. So the, the, the big three uh, that will get you certified. I guarantee it. Uh, we have those for both A plus and Network Plus, and we also have the Security Plus video and total tester bundle. We don't have the total the, the Sims yet for Security Plus. We're working on them, but you can get the video and total tester for half price. Just use the code MMLive824 at checkout, and that's good through Sunday. Thanks, Scott. Now back to you. <laughs> right you are, Kevin. <laughs> Who gets that reference? I'm going to see that posted up there in the next two minutes. <laughs> or write you are cotton. Another good one. Oh, what else popped up? Andre posted and bailed. There we go. Will a home file server be about the same to install and set up? Good question. Next Monday or next Friday. Uh, that was in my notes to check out. I, I did all the checkouts that I was supposed to except that one. So now circling it, home server on Pi. I'm going to guess it's pretty easy. I helped a gent create a Pi and do some configuration on it for him to set up a home server. And he wasn't particularly technical and uh, went home and had it all running over the course of the weekend. So not my guess, stunningly challenging. Glad you enjoyed it, Marvin. Will SEC plus be 601, ask article Scott. I know you're typing and researching. Right, which I was actually, in case I didn't get to it since we're right at, the, right at four o'clock. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm writing the 501 security plus simulations, but I'm already writing the 601 book. So I'm, I'm definitely going to immediately go into the 601 product. So there shouldn't be any real delay in getting this, the 601 simulations done 
like early next year. Excellent. All right. Well, it's on the hour. It's going to about to flip on my computer. It has been fun as always having you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Mike, who can't hear us, but he'll watch this just to see what we did. So thanks, Mike, for allowing us to have this time. Many thanks to my partner in crimes, Scott. Knows Bye. this stuff. Very helpful running the feeds. Behind the scenes, we got Michael Smyer and others. So we will see you Monday for the AMA, Wednesday for the AMA, and again next week here. Fun stuff for another Pi Day Friday dramas. Till then, good. Farewell. Bye. Now we get the awkward stare. <laughs> <laughs> I love just sitting here trying to hold still.